only been here for a few weeks, and although you have gone very fast, and this is of course the kind of an immersion program that you're in, and it can be extremely demanding, and one of the reasons for this lecture is that we are aware that um, people can find it extremely stressful and extremely difficult. And so the first thing I want to say to you is that it's normal. If you're feeling that you can't cope and you don't understand what's going on, that's actually how most of you are feeling. That's normal. Don't add to the burden by berating yourself for feeling anxious and, uh, and concerned. Um, so we talk about, about this. Um, in the course, um, I, don't know, I don't think you've done very much on the legal profession so far, um, but the course in, incorporates looking at the history of the legal profession up to the time of the, uh, uh, really up to the 20th century, and how the profession and the, the, the training of people and so on interacted with the institutions and so on in order to develop a profession. And in fact, the profession that we know today, we take a lot of information um, and a lot of institutions have just been brought from the British system and then adapted to our system. But in the case of the legal profession, it looks, the British one looks extremely familiar because we also have the barrister, solicitor divide and so on. Um, the 20th century was a significant, created significant changes in the legal profession. So before I go on to, to talking about this, I just want to point out to you that for those of you who did manage to read chapter 16, you will see that it's that what I'm talking about there is the fact that up until the 19, probably the early 1960s, the legal profession was nearly all smallish family-based firms. Um, the large firms that we see today are a very new phenomenon, and this phenomenon exists across the whole world. It all happened around the early 80s um, and is partly a response to the development of significant consumer legislation throughout the Western world. So all of a sudden, very large law firms came into, came into play because it was worth it for very large manufacturers, large um, corporations and so on to protect themselves by having a very close and cosy relationship with law firms. And so we suddenly developed the mega firm, which of course we, is now one of the, um, I guess it's, there's a, we now say there are three kinds of uh, lawyers. There are barristers, there are solicitors in general, and then there are solicitors in large law firms. One of the things I would really like you to take away from today is to not fall into the trap of assuming that working in a large law firm is the pinnacle of legal practice. It's just one form of legal practice that's all it serves. It's useful for some people, but it is certainly not the only one, and it's really important that you don't fall into the trap of thinking that it's the only way. So, looking at the legal profession um, nowadays, I guess one of the things to talk about is the fact that we're talking about a profession. So what, what's a profession? If we go back to the medieval times, there were three. The priesthood, the lawyer, and the physician. Those were the original three professions. They were all regarded as healing professions. And the thing that was uh, the marker of those professions was that they were supposed to put their client, their patient, or their... Um, their congregant ahead of themselves. That was the mark of the profession. Whether that continues to be the mark of a profession is something that you may all well need to consider. Um, but one of the questions that we have to answer, I think, as professionals and as lawyers today is the extent to which it is meaningful to call law a profession. And what I would like to suggest to you is that it's actually important that we do and that we see the profession as a service profession and that the role of the lawyer in the service profession is extremely important. And that is the lawyer who upholds the role of law, the rule of law, and puts their clients ahead of themselves. So, we're moving into a profession. This is how Roscoe Pound defined a profession. He said, it's a group pursuing a learned art 
as a common calling in the spirit of a public service. Now, you will, later on, you will do courses in professional ethics. You'll do a course here called Lawyers, Ethics and Justice, which addresses the particular legal ethics that lawyers have to deal with. And, you know, and you will be already familiar with some of them. The idea that the lawyer has to appear for, uh, that a barrister has to appear for a client, that they can't say no in certain circumstances, um, that you, everybody's entitled to representation, so you, it isn't a matter of you always agreeing or thinking that your client is right, and so on. These are parts of the uh, professional ethics, and there are lots and lots of rules, and you'll be learning them. And one of the things that this lecture today is about is how you end up relating your personal identity with the professional identity that you're going to develop. Um, one of the reasons for this is that we know that a great deal of stress that lawyers suffer from relates to questions of professional ethics. Um, so there are really difficult um, issues for many lawyers in that they, um, because lawyers are adversarial advocates um, and so on, the lawyer is supposed to decide what is in the client's best interest. Um, things like that. There are there are great difficulties sometimes in balancing out the instructions your client may be giving you um, with your legal ethics, the rules that you're supposed to follow, or indeed you may feel that your personal morality is actually at risk here. So one of the things that we know about the legal profession is that a great many people who leave the legal profession do so because of something that they regard as an ethical issue. What this means is that we need to know, we need, people need to think carefully about their personal professional ethics. And I see this lecture as the start, hopefully, the beginning of you developing a sense of your identity as a person, as a professional, um, because I see this as one of the most significant ways to develop resilience in the face of the stresses that are inevitable. So this is not, I want to, I'm going to talk to you about resilience and anxiety and depression and so on. I am not, this lecture is not about saying to you that the best thing in your life is for every stress to go away. Because A, that's completely unrealistic um, and B, it's not true. People need a certain level of stress. There are all sorts of issues. Okay, so the first problem is looking at what we know about law students and lawyers and depression. And depression. Now, when I first started looking at this sort of issue, uh, there was a lot of American data about lawyers in the US being, having very high rates of suicide, very high rates of depression, and so on, um, and that they were disproportionately affected compared to the rest of the population. What we, um, there was of course initially no data in Australia. So in 2008, the Brain and Mind Institute did some investigation and they did a survey and this has been repeated again, um, finding relatively similar um, outcomes, finding that 35% plus of law students, 33% of solicitors and 20% of barristers have disabling levels of depression. Now, before you run away with the idea that being a lawyer means you must be depressed, um, I need to say to you that this is not an inevitability and there are a whole range of reasons for this. But it does mean, in my opinion, that there are things that you ought to think about when you're doing law in order to ensure that you are protected as far as you can do that. One thing that we do know, and this is the reason that people say it's law, law school that causes all the problems, um, is that when law students arrive in law school, they feel terrific. When they first come, yay, I got in, it's great. Um, here we are, terrific stuff. And, and that's right. Within six to 12 months, they're starting to get depressed. Right, so it's obviously our fault. Now, um, okay, so, some of the questions here is why does this happen? What's going on? Um, and 
let's just let's just keep reminding you that the data that we're looking at is statistical data. When it says that 35% or of your students um, have disabling levels of depression, what we are doing is we're seeing a pattern where law students present that, but the general pattern across the population is about 25%. So it's not that much higher, but it is higher. So the very fact of being alive is a risk factor for depression. Okay, so don't run away with the, the idea that this is all inevitable, because it really isn't. Okay, so how do we um, try and develop resilience? Now resilience, I've, I've started to detest this word, um, because it's become so trendy lately. But um, we are talking about being able to bounce back. Being able, when something comes and whacks you in the head, being able to stand up again. That's what resilience means in this context. It means the ability to carry on when life gets tough. And, you know, and although most of you are young, from my perspective at least, even if you don't think so, um, you should know by now that nobody gets through life scot free. So everybody has to deal with stuff in their lives. The question is, how do we do it? How do we manage it? How do we make it work for us? Um, so that we can do the things that we want to do. So that's what this is about. We know from the psychological literature that um, in order to have well-being, another word I currently detest, um, and uh, resilience, we need things like people need to feel secure, they need to have a good sense of their self-esteem, they need to feel competent, they need to feel socially connected, and they need some sense of autonomy. They need some sense that they have some control over their life. Um, these things are really important. Okay, now here's a bit where I say the things that your mother probably has said to you. Okay, so at the risk of repeating something you already know perfectly well, your physical health and your fitness are important for your mental health and fitness. Um, you know, you need to eat a balanced diet. You know, one with lots of colours in it. Um, <laughs> um, you need to think about the balance in your life, your work-life balance. One of the things that's really, you need to think sensibly about, and you will know which group of people you're in, the ones who don't do enough or the ones who do too much, that you actually do need breaks because your brain actually runs out. If you keep on working when you're too tired, you won't be very effective. So working that out, getting that balance right, avoiding the tipping points that you have come to know about yourself. The point at which you know that you're about to... For example, a tipping point for me is I know that I am too stressed when I start making lists about lists. <laughs> and when I'm making lists about lists, I know that that's the time for me to actually pack things up and go and lie down or something. Um, so I know that particular one is one of my signs, um, and I try to. So Amira will tell you, but I'm not very good at going and lying down when this happened, but I do try. Um, so, um, we've already talked about that. So, one of the things, this is just about helping to manage. You know, when you come into law school, one of the things we try and teach you is how to manage to read large amounts of written material. And it feels, I know when you, when you first come, it feels like somebody's trying to force an enormous thing down your throat and you can't swallow it. Um, so it takes time to, to get to that point where you can swallow it um, and where you think, oh, and indeed, you think, oh, that's quite tasty. So you may not feel that you are there yet, but it will come. So you, you know, have faith, it will come. And then you'll be, you know, like Mira and me who say things like, isn't that a lovely case? Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> when you're there, you know, you'll be, you'll be going well. Um, so managing the things that cause you problems. This is what we're trying to do. So we talk, in, we, we talk in class about how to manage the cases and the load of the reading and, and so on. And here I, I'm trying to get you, I want you to be looking at the other things that can help you to get through and not feel as if everything's a disaster. Right, so we did a big survey. It was quite a long time ago now. I forget what year it was, was it 2007? Something like that. So what we did, this survey was done partly in answer to the question, why 
why are law students coming here and feeling terrific? And then um, a few months later, feeling terrible. What's going on? Is it all our fault? Okay, so one way of looking at this is this is a survey done in order to prove that it wasn't all our fault. But um, we did try and do this properly. So what we did was we had a questionnaire. It was, it was done by 3,000 students on, across the university. And we compared students from law with students from every other faculty. So what we are looking at was um, a series of questions that they answered. And those questions were not about whether they were depressed or not. They were questions about their attitudes to learning and how they learned. Um, and we then use those questions to interpret, to, to look at things in the light of the psychological knowledge we have of how people, um, how people operate. So do, do they have problems with autonomy? Are they disconnected socially, etc.? So we found these are the factors. We thought that we'd find that law, law school and medicine would be very similar. And in fact, we didn't find it. They, they were actually, again, quite different. Law students stood out from every other faculty in this particular way. Now, again, just because I'm saying that, they, that law students were disproportionately like this, this does not mean that every law student is or was like this. So they were more likely to be doing a reason for a course that was a, for doing the course for a reason that was external to themselves. So because somebody else wanted them to. That was quite common. Um, much more common than in any other faculty. They were more likely to think that their studies were not intrinsically interesting. I can't understand that. So, uh, but, they were, but they were much more likely to do that. They were more likely, if they were asked questions about employers, to see their marks as the only thing the employer would be interested in not their social characteristics or their ability to work in a team or any of those things. They really disliked working in groups. They didn't like that at all. And in fact, medic medicine was quite like law in that respect. They also didn't like working in groups. Um, they valued the reputation of their university much higher than most other groups. It's a very significant thing for them. They were less likely to say that they were at university in order to learn than to get a ticket. So, um, and they were more likely to see their friendships in terms of a useful network. Now that's um, a bit alarming, I think. Um, and they were, again, so they were most likely to see their marks as the most important motivator or the most important indicator of their success. So what we are looking at here, I would say, is this is the same set, but I've divided um, them into different colours according to whether I think they are about the two factors that I think are really important here. One is the factor of autonomy, that is people feeling that they are in charge of themselves, and the other one is the factor of social connectedness. So what we've got is a whole range of factors that in my opinion indicate a lack of autonomy. So a lack of feeling that the person is in control of their own destiny. So you're doing the degree because somebody else wants you to. You, um, you are looking at things that are external to yourself. Marks are very important. Marks are, if you use marks, for example, as a way of evaluating yourself as opposed to evaluating your work, you're actually doing something really dangerous. Because if you think of yourself as a person who gets 68% or whatever, and then you get 30%, which is extremely unlikely. But if you do that, then you, you've handed yourself over to somebody else. So thinking about things like that is quite important. Similarly, the reputational factors and so on. Um, similarly, the um, social connectedness factors seem to be quite important in the way that the students responded. Now, it seems to me that you know, we cannot make sure that you have a roof over your head. We can't do some of those things. But the things that we can look at include helping you to look at your own sense of personal and professional identity, and in particular, to give to encourage you to develop a sense of agency about what you're doing. That is a sense that you're in charge. You need to think about 
whether your motivation is internal or external, it's worth working, trying to make your motivation internal rather than external because if it's internal, you're in charge of it. Um, your self-evaluation rather than external evaluation is important. Um, if you allow other people to evaluate yourself always, you're actually um, handing yourself over. Now, the, I, um, I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, you know, allowing, you know, looking at your own ethics and your own sense of meaning and your own sense of satisfaction rather than letting somebody else dictate that to you. All of those things are things that it's possible for people to do and that law students have, have shown they are disproportionately less likely to do. So it's worth thinking about. The number one tool that seems to be useful in trying to do this is um, that thing that, again, it's another thing that's become trendy. So mindfulness. I used to, I used to sort of feel that I was ahead of the pack and now, now everybody's doing mindfulness. So, um, now I'm not talking about necessarily doing mindful meditation. I'm talking about the idea that mindful meditation or any other kind of mindfulness is a very valuable tool for developing one's sense of oneself, who one is, developing the ability to evaluate well and so on. And it has the other extraordinarily valuable thing which is um, it enhances your concentration. It actually um, in, is very likely to improve your work as a lawyer because it is about focus and things like that. Um, so, if we connect this to this question of profession, of the idea of the professional, you will see that in the legal community there's been a lot of talk, uh, particularly in, the, in the, the United States, about the fact that they actually attribute a large part of the problems with mental health in the profession to the loss of the sense of being a lawyer as a proper professional. So, there's been a call for um, a, a, a move back to the sense of the law, the lawyer as a professional, as a person who, what they call a lawyer statesman, a person of practical wisdom, who can do this thing that we are trying to train you to do, which is learn to come to judgment. Coming to judgment is the hardest thing to learn to do in law. We can teach you the Mirac method, we can teach you how to do your problem solving and so on, but at every point, we have to say, and in the end, what is your conclusion? And you must come to a conclusion. You can be a philosopher and you don't have to come to a conclusion. But a lawyer has to, because the lawyer or the judge, in the end, has to deal with real person, real people with real problems, and what they have to give is a judgment. That's a very difficult thing and it requires a very complex cognitive process in order to do that. It isn't just about applying logic. It's a lot more than that. So, all right. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about mindfulness. Um, so for those of you who haven't been overrun by the mindfulness juggernaut already, the this mindfulness is um, most often seen in the first of all for people in the context of mindfulness meditation. So that is finding a system of meditation where these things happen. So you are present in the moment. So part of what mindfulness is trying to do is stop people always thinking about the present, about the future and the past, and focus on what you're doing now. <coughs> it's surprisingly restful to focus on what's going on right now. Um, in the legal profession, with its culture of speed, the adversarialness and so on, it's really easy to just get into a, into a state of what I call mindlessness because you cannot concentrate, you're rushing and there's everything's all here and what are you going to do with it and um, how am I possibly going to deal with all this stuff? The moment at which I'm making lists about my lists, this is a mindlessness moment. Um, and, it, and if you can learn to do something that can shift you from that and into a still and calm 
um, sense, then that is very relaxing. It's very, very useful. Um, so what I'd like to do, you to do just now, just going to have a little exercise. So first of all, I'm going to ask you to put your hand here and here. And, okay. Yeah, this is a bit touchy-feely for lawyers, isn't it? <laughs> so, so now, just feel which, which one of your hands is going in and out the most. So is it the one on your belly or the one on your chest? Okay, those of you who, it's the belly, put your hand up. Okay, those of you that it's on the chest, the chest. Okay, now you notice there's a lot more chest people. Usually that's a sign of anxiety. So if you're using high chest breathing, that's not what you do when you're really calm. When you're really calm, you're much likely to use lower chest breathing. So, um, that's something to think about. Um, <laughs> I'm sure it's also possible to be calm while doing chest breathing, but um, that is what is said. So, and the other thing is I just like, I'm just going to do something even more touchy-feely, which is get you to close your eyes, and I'm just going to take you through a really short mindfulness exercise. So close your eyes, and just make sure you're sitting so that you can feel where your body is touching the chair. And for those of you who've got your computer screens open, Close them, close them. <laughs> yes, do that. Yeah. Okay, so eyes closed. Um, now what I want you to do is just pay attention to your breathing. So begin by just paying attention to the air as it comes in through your nostrils. Just feel it as it goes in through your nostrils and down and into your lungs. You might notice your chest going up and down, and then as it goes out again, feel the, <coughs> the pressure of the air going out again through, through your nose. And just keep paying attention to where the breath is. So you might find that your mind will go off to something else. So if it goes off and you find that you're not actually focused on your breath at this moment, just bring your attention back to your breath. You don't need to be cross with yourself. Just Bring it back and, and notice where that breathing is and the feeling of the air going in through your nose and then into your lungs and back out again. Try and pay attention to that and letting your mind settle on the, the feeling of that air going in and then out again of your, of your nose and out of your lungs. And at the same time, you might also notice the feeling of your, your body pressed against the back of the seat. And at each time you're just thinking about what's it feel like right now as I'm breathing in this particular space. And as I said, if your mind goes off to, you know, think, you know, what the hell is she talking about or whatever, just bring your attention back and focus again on the breath. So take one more breath in, and then let that breath out, paying attention to it coming out, and then open your eyes. Okay, so now most people who are doing a mindfulness um, meditation exercise will spend longer than that, of course, because that's obviously only a tiny taste. But it's very, very simple. There's nothing really magical or strange about it. It's just paying attention to something that's right, that's present in such a way that you are um, aware of yourself in that present moment. What you're actually doing is training your ability to focus and that gives us real benefits. It gives us benefits in relation to stress, um, slowing your metabolism and your cortisol levels and, and all of these sorts of things. I don't, I don't really need to spend much time on this. Um, but what, what it seems to do, it seems to improve, the, improve people's health and well-being in a whole range of ways. The question is, there are also these cognitive benefits which lawyers are more interested in than relaxation. <laughs> um, so they're more interested in the idea that it can heighten your self-awareness and your ability to concentrate, that you can, it'll improve your ability to retain and retrieve information, 
And now the other thing that I'm really interested in is that it also seems to enhance people's ability to um, empathically respond to other people. Um, it improves their ability to be compassionate with themselves. This is a problem that lots and lots of law students have, that they kind of thrash themselves. So if they do something wrong, they go, oh, you stupid idiot, they talk to themselves like that. Um, when actually, what they could say is, oh, you did that again, I wonder why you did that. You know, it's, you did that, oh, well, you didn't really mean to, that's all, that's okay, next time you can try again. So you don't have to be so tough on yourself. And we know that mindfulness meditation of this kind actually seems to help people improve these things and also improve their general cognitive levels of functioning. Um, what, one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is the fact that mindfulness uh, meditation and other kinds of um, um, contemplative exercises seem to actually develop something we call metacognition. Metacognition is the ability to stand back <coughs> and look at yourself or to observe other things accurately in a way that where you are relatively detached and therefore not hurt by what you're seeing. Um, this is actually extraordinarily important for lawyers because for lawyers often um, you need to, you need to, as I said, you need to learn to come to judgment. You need to judge other people. But if you judge people in what we call judgmentally, you may actually do quite a lot of harm. So there's, it's actually quite important that you can learn to refrain from overacting or overreacting to situations because this kind of focus on um, mindfulness and contemplation and um, working out what is really in front of you is really important. Now I'll just give you a little example. A friend of mine, um, was a, a young lawyer and she was in the family court with her client and while she was in the family court with her client um, the judge gave her an absolute pasting. The judge said to her, "This is it is outrageous, your client has, has come here, you haven't made sure that your client did the right things, your client hasn't bothered to turn up for X, Y and Z and basically she felt that she had been abused by the judge and she came out of the court thinking to herself, I can never do this job, I am just stupid, there's no way I can do this, I'm not going to, I am never going to do this again. And, the, and a more senior colleague came up to her and said to her, you realise that the judge only said that to you because he couldn't say it to the client. That actually what the judge was doing was trying to get a message through to the client by putting it through you. It wasn't about you at all. It was just a way that the judge was trying to use to get through to the client. So the ability to stand back, look at what seems like abuse and say, well, what's it really all about? Is this really about me? Is there any validity in it? Etc. etc. was a really important thing for her to learn in order for her to deal with some of the nasty things that can go on when you're in a profession that's dealing with difficult things in people's lives. Okay, so how do we know all this stuff? Well, we've got these nice pictures. <laughs> so here's a nice picture of a, uh, a Tibetan monk. Um, and we all know that they're the best meditators in the world. And he's been um, um, hooked up to a neural net and his brain waves are being studied. And there's been lots of this sort of work now, now that neural, um, neural mapping and um, uh, what is it, MRIs and, and things like that can be done. So we actually have really, we used to have, you know, amounts of people say, well, people seem to be better if they do this and they seem to be better if they, if they do that. Now we can actually take pictures of brains and we can see that things like um, learning, to, learning to meditate or learning to um, focus on particular things actually changes the brain. So we know, for example, that um, the amygdala, which is a very, this is a bit, it's got a yellow spot on it in this particular picture. The amygdala is um, very much associated with the development of empathy. And in, um, in meditators, the amygdala gets bigger. Similarly, in meditators, the frontal cortex, the uh, corpus callosum gets thicker. 
Now that's where we do our high level cognitive function. So all things that I've been saying actually do have some backup in, um, in um, neuro, neuro studies of various kinds which have actually found actual changes in the brain because of people have doing this kind of activity. Right, so I've already talked about that. Um, so I think, um, now well, I'm using mindfulness here as a shorthand for paying attention to who you are and what you're doing and doing it in such a way that you are seeing the reality and not allowing the delusions that most of us have to get in the way of whatever you can see. So it seems to me that in law and legal training these things are useful. This does not mean that I'm saying to you, you must all go out and start doing mindfulness meditation. I'm not doing that. I'm not saying that. It is not what I'm saying, suggesting is that what you should be doing now in your course is to be thinking about what suits you and what doesn't suit you, how you do things, how your own um, ideas about your ethics and so on um, operate. You might consider, I'm not suggesting that you have to do it, but in the book, there is a possible exercise you can do, um, which is just to think about what you would like people to say at your funeral. It's an interesting exercise because lots of people are not thinking about that when they're thinking about what they'd like to do with their life. And yet sometimes, if you think about what you'd like people to say about you after you die, that might suggest to you some values that you didn't realise you had. So, you know, that might be something that you could think about. Um, so, the idea of metacognition, that is that you need to learn for law to, um, to be able to think about thinking, to be able to think about yourself from a fairly neutral perspective, to be able to think about other people from a fairly neutral perspective, which includes a, a certain level of empathy. Um, these are things that are really, really valuable for, for the the process of being a lawyer. So what I would suggest to you is that one of the things that you ought to be doing in order to make sure that all this all this stuff that looks sometimes like a horrible load of crap coming <coughs> towards you um, doesn't completely overwhelm you is to be able to think carefully about who you are. So have an authentic sense of yourself and that Authentic sense of yourself needs to consider ethical dilemmas. Now, I might not say this to business <coughs> students. Now, this is not because I think all business students have no ethical, um, ethical interests or anything, but it is because there is some evidence that people who go into professions have, have different personality characteristics from people who go into business. And so they are a bit more likely to be interested in getting into the profession in order to serve other people. The thinking about that and whether that's what you're interested in is important. I think you need to develop a grammar for yourself for discussing and developing your own ethical program and working out how you will deal with ethical dilemmas. And let me just point out to you, you are about to do an assignment, are you not? Is it on Monday you get an assignment? Okay. Now that raises significant sum ethical dilemmas that are real. And what I'm talking about here is plagiarism. Whose work is going to be handed in by you? It needs to be your own. It is unethical to use somebody else's work and pass it off as your own. You know, it's also not very good for your learning and so on, but it's just immoral. It's theft. So we take it really seriously. You need to pay attention to that. So there are ethical dilemmas right here in front of you right now and you need, you may find it no problem at all to think about it. You may be absolutely clear now, well that's great, but work out why you're absolutely clear because that is going to be useful to you when you come to a dilemma where you feel that you don't quite know. Because if you're thinking about why you decided the thing you did, then later on um, there will be you will actually have some kind of structure that you can fit your ethical arguments to. Okay, 
So the other thing is to enhance your social connectedness. Um, friendship for friendship's sake, not for networking. It's really important. One of the problems we have with law students is we know that when they run into trouble, they don't want to tell anyone about it. They think they can fix themselves and they don't go and ask for help. Um, part, of this, so part of this may be um, because of a sense of friendships as not really being about friendship but being about networking. Um, because if you're just in a network rather than in a friendship, then your network needs to be strong, it needs to be full of people who are very capable, etc. But a friendship group doesn't work like that. A friendship group supports people when they're feeling down and knows that everybody has a moment of feeling down now and again. Um, that's a quite different thing. So it's worth thinking about that and um, I, think, I think it's actually really valuable. The social skills of courtesy and respect are very important. Unfortunately, the legal profession is going through a period when those social skills, even the skills within the courts and so on, are suffering because lawyers are failing to do them. I was in court the other day and a whole bunch of lawyers came in and just talked over the top of the judge. I couldn't believe it. I saw that actually just on Wednesday. I oh, I couldn't actually, believe it. I was quite surprised. The roof notes. No, it's just a, it's kind of, it's, and I, one of the things I noticed, so the judge came to the bench, the lawyers were still discussing the issue, he didn't stop. They were also there being mine, so everyone could move. Unbelievable. And I was, I recollected that there's been a recent study of the Supreme Court and looking at which judges are more likely to be interrupted by which advocates. Yes. And that there is a gender dimension to that. Yes. And I, it did occur to me that that might have been one of the, one of the factors driving that. Yes. It's very interesting. I've never yeah. seen it before. I've never seen it as a judge. Well, I've never seen it before this yeah. time. And I when I was talking to the judge question. after the case, he said to me, he actually brought it up as an issue. He, he thought that younger lawyers, um, courtesy and, and adherence to the norm, to the traditional norms of courtesy at the bench are uh, at risk. And that's a serious issue. I think that's a really serious issue. Why is it important? It's not important that you can say, you know, my learned colleague or my learned friend and all that. That doesn't matter. But what matters is that you use forms that refer to the person who is opposing you on the bench because otherwise what you're doing is, otherwise you're basically just having a fight. It's the whole point of the legal system is to take disputes away from people who would otherwise have a feud or something and deal with it in a, in a much more civilised fashion. And for that, the principles of courtesy of the profession are vitally important. So don't think this is just some hidebound traditional piece of crap that we can ignore. It's not. It's actually fairly fundamental to the idea of the rule of law. So it's important. Okay, so if you're going to become a resilient lawyer and or student, then you use the best tools that you have available to you. So um, one of the best tools that you have available to you is to ask somebody for help when something goes wrong and to ask early rather than later. If you ask early and you just talk to a friend, often you can head off a big problem early. If you are, um, if it's worse than that, then you can ask a staff member, <coughs> you can ask a, um, you can go to counselling, you can go at the, the university office free counselling, you can go to your GP, all these things are sensible things to do if you are being distressed. Nobody is going to hold it against you. This is actually something that's really important for you to understand. We all know what it is like. We all have struggled through a law degree. We might have done well in it, but that doesn't mean... I can remember the first few weeks of my law degree and thinking, I have no idea what is happening. <laughs> um, so. You know, we've all, we've all lived through this and we all know that every now and then life comes up and, and does something awful to people and if we can help each other. So you're in a law school where people really do try to help. So take advantage of it. But if we're not the most appropriate people, go to someone else who is. 
and don't try and and just fix yourself because you don't want to let anybody know that you have some weakness. Everybody has weakness. There is nobody who can withstand appalling stress without getting into trouble. But we all have times when we're coping well and times when we're not coping so well. So one of the important things about this lecture is to remind you that you may not be the best person to treat yourself if you are having um, serious issues with depression or anxiety. It may be better to get somebody else in on the thing with you because that just works better. We're not very good at looking at ourselves quite often. Um, so, if you are interested in doing mindfulness meditation, um, there are all sorts of apps. Now, just one little word of caution. If you already, if you actually are seriously depressed now, and you have a tendency to ruminate, you should not do mindfulness meditation now. Okay? You should go and see somebody. <laughs> but for everybody else, this is something to get started when you're well, in order to enhance your, your general well-being. You don't need to do anything at all. Nobody's going to ask you whether you are. That's fine. We just want you to have the opportunity to be able to deal with these things in the future because we know that being a law student and often being a lawyer can be stressful. We can't take all those stresses away. For example, people have said this to me before, can you stop marking our essays? No. <laughs> no, we cannot. We must inflict that stress on you. So um, it's about you learning to deal with the stress rather than us taking all the stress away. Um, and, you know, we're not involved, so things do sometimes go wrong. But, you know, you can always ask Mera or me. We're available for an appointment if you send us an email and, then, and um, we will make time to see you. So that can be done as well. Now, I've just burbled on. Are there any questions? I have looked at your faces, so I knew whether you were asleep or not. But, uh, <laughs> but, but are there any questions? And if you don't want to ask a question now, I'm quite happy for you to send me an email and I'll answer either by email or, or see you if that's what you want. No? Okay, well thank you very much for coming.